It's really taking calls to Newcastle then to talk in this place about some of the things I wish to talk about, but nonetheless, I would like to talk about the treaty-making tradition in Canada and British Columbia's place in it under the general heading that we are all treaty people. Although native newcomer relations have occurred in this part of the country since at least the late 18th century when this village was painted, there tends to be a view, perhaps not in this audience, but in some parts of Canada, that British Columbia is an anomaly or an aberration that does not have or it's not part of the treaty history. But of course, British Columbians are part of that we who are all treaty people. British Columbia is part of a treaty tradition in Canada, and it does have its own treaty history as well. British Columbia participated in what I argue is the first phase of treaty making, something that's not always recognized as being treaty, but I think is, what I term commercial compacts, the kind of informal agreements that were made within the fur trade from the very earliest contacts. Among First Nations people, it was impossible to deal with others unless they had some kind of relationship with them. In other words, unless they established some form of kinship, they could not be sure that the people with whom they were dealing were friendly and well disposed towards them. They might, in fact, harbor ill intent. And so European fur traders, whether it was in the east or in the in northwestern interior or later in British Columbia, found very, very quickly that to engage in the fur trade, they must establish kin-like relationships with indigenous people. And they did that through ceremonies. They did that through ceremonies that were First Nations ceremonies or protocols. Ceremonies that included formal greetings and welcomes, such as is depicted here, for example. Discharge of the firearm as part of a formal welcome, or in this case, approach by the trading party. And followed as well by with the greetings, with the exchange of presents, feasting, smoking the pipe, for example, and speech making. This was not the way Europeans conducted business. This was not European style trade. This was First Nations or indigenous trade uh, conducted according to First Nations protocols and ceremonies. And it had to be that way because Europeans needed the First Nations to conduct the fur trade and that was the only way First Nations could do so. So Europeans found themselves drawn into a new system. They found them, the circle of kinship that First Nations peoples had widened to include them. And it's my argument that those relationships are a form of treaty. They are commercial compacts. They are not casual or brief intermittent arrangements. Quite the contrary. They're highly, highly formal and very often enduring. They're initiated, as I said, through ceremony and they are renewed and kept vital year to year by the same mechanisms. If they're not renewed, they lapse. These are not casual commercial contacts. These are something more substantial. A trading captain who visited a post and was happy with the treatment that he and his colleagues had received would leave his pipe behind at the post, signaling that the relationship endured and they would return next year or as soon as they could. Conversely, when a First Nations trading party was dissatisfied with how they'd been treated, the trading captain would remove his pipe when they left, signaling thereby that the relationship was at an end. Europeans learned to enter into commercial compacts through ceremony, First Nations ceremony, in order to conduct the first kind of economic activity in which they engaged, the fur trade in particular. For Europeans, from those commercial compacts, from those fur trade linkages, emerged a second kind of relationship. Relationships that were focused not on trade, but on alliance and diplomatic support and, if necessary, military support. The treaties of peace and friendship. Treaties that begin informally at first and later will become more formalized. For First Nations people, 
They're often recorded, particularly in the eastern part of the country, in wampum belts, such as this one. They're archives, basically. And they are made and they are renewed just as the fur trade relationships were made through aboriginal ceremony. I said that this is a kind of outgrowth of the commercial compact, but to put it that way is, in fact, a highly Eurocentric way to describe it, because that is not how First Nations people would have perceived it. How First Nations perceived these relationships was expressed very, very succinctly and effectively by a Haudenosaunee diplomat who said to the governor of New York in 1735, trade and peace we take to be one thing. You can't have one without the other. Commercial compacts, informal treaties of peace and friendship are merely two sides of the same coin. And that coin is kinship. And that coin is kept bright with the use and repetition of First Nations ceremonies and protocols. Peace and friendship treaties begin informally alongside commercial compacts but soon they become more formalized. One of the spectacular examples in Eastern Canada of the Peace and Friendship Treaty is the Great Peace of Montreal of 1701. It's some, believed by some that this wampum belt, which if you're sharp-eyed you may realize is the same wampum as in the previous slide. Here the chief is simply telling the wampum, reciting the meaning of the symbols that are captured in it. Peace, the Treaty of 1701 was an incredible diplomatic achievement. For one thing, it involved 36 or 37 different First Nations that's, whose territory stretched from the Atlantic well into the upper Great Lakes. An enormous territory and many, many thousands of people. It was the means by which the French and the Iroquois normalized their relations after more than 60 years of on and off conflict. It was an extraordinary diplomatic achievement, proof that treaties of peace and friendship were major, major instruments and very important. In the Maritimes, there was another series of peace and friendship treaties as well. And of course, in the Maritimes, as well as in the American interior, it wasn't the French that were involved in these agreements, but rather the British. And what you see happening with British forest diplomats like this man, he may look like a court dandy, but he is the, probably the most effective forest diplomat that Britain ever fielded in North America. This is William Johnson. In fact, if you like, the first Minister of Indian Affairs. He was appointed to be the Superintendent of the Northern Indians in 1755, when Britain created the Indian Department, for example. So you find British who wish to conciliate and establish relationships, particularly for diplomatic and military reasons, going through the same ceremonies as I described on the part of fur traders. And for William Johnson, this came very, very naturally. He was a fur trader in his own background. Not only that, William Johnson was married to a Mohawk clan mother, Molly Brandt. He was married into the Five Nations, as they then were later Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee. So he was very much the master of all those protocols, all those ceremonies as well. Both British and French European military and diplomatic and political leaders learned, as fur traders did, to conduct themselves the way First Nations did, to use ceremony to establish and renew the relationships that were so vital for the prosecution of the activities they were there in North America to pursue. The high watermark of peace and friendship treaties is roughly the period from about 1701 to 1760s. You have such things as the Great Peace in 1701. You have what's known as Mascarene's Treaty in 1726 in Nova Scotia. It's the northern extension of the Treaty of Boston, in fact, which put an end to warfare with the Abenaki. It's renewed in 1749. There's another treaty to deal with the Mi'kmaq in 1752 after Halifax is founded, and that disrupts relations with them, for example. And then finally, well not finally, but for our purpose tonight finally, in 1760-61, a series of treaties with Mi'kmaq, peace and friendship treaties as well, after the cessation of hostilities. So the peace and friendship era is a very active, intense, and lively era of treaty making in the East. 
Why? Well, because this is the period when France and England are contending for control of the eastern part of North America. This is the era of imperial rivalry, and both European nations are trying to attract the support and alliance of First Nations. And that's what this treaty making is largely about. That period of imperial rivalry in North America came to an end in 1763. And it came to an end, of course, with the end of the Seven Years' War, in which Britain triumphed over France. France ceded almost all its North American possessions to Great Britain. And there was all wrapped up in the, <coughs> pardon me, the Peace of Paris of 1763. Another document that comes in the same year will usher in a third kind of treaty. In October of 1763, George III issues the famous Royal Proclamation, known usually as the Royal Proclamation of 1763, probably the most important single document in the history of treaty making in Canada. Most of the Royal Proclamation deals with things like new, the boundaries of new colonies, colonies that Britain had acquired through war, or the institutions of government and justice in those colonies, and things like that. But at the end of the document, there are a half dozen paragraphs that deal specifically with First Nations questions, and all of them are extremely important. The Royal Proclamation defines the western boundaries of Britain's colonies, both above the St. Lawrence River in what's now Canada, but also in the 13 colonies in the future United States. More than that, it forbids settlement beyond those western boundaries, a source of great irritation to the American colonists. And it does that in a variety of ways. One of the important things that it does is it says the lands west of that bound, those boundary lines are, quote, reserved to them as their hunting grounds, them, of course, being the First Nations. So Great Britain is recognizing some kind of territorial right on the part of First Nations when it says that. And it says more. It says that these clauses apply <clears throat> to those with whom we are connected and those who are under our protection, meaning it's talking about the First Nations with whom it is in alliance, basically, as relationship. And it says, well, those lands are reserved to them as their hunting grounds, but if they wish to give them up, if they wish to make them available to other people, it must be done a particular way. If they wish to dispose of those lands reserved to them, they can, that can be done only to us at a public meeting called for the purpose. Every one of those words is pregnant with meaning. Every one of those words is potent with significance. Those words are the formula for making the third kind of treaty in Canadian history, the territorial treaty. And this is the template. This is the foundation of the territorial treaty. And what the phrase means is, when it says only to us, it means only to the crown. No private enterprise, no land developers or speculators can make deals for land with First Nations people. And it can be done only at a public meeting. There can be no subterfuge, no deceit. The community that is agreeing to let others have some of their territory must know what is going on. Sometimes that had not occurred prior, particularly in the 13 colonies. And it must be a public meeting called for the purpose. This is quite simply <clears throat> the formula for making territorial treaties that will be in place over the next 160 years, approximately, in Canada, particularly starting in the east but moving further west. And the Pro Royal Proclamation formula is refined first in Upper Canada, Southern Ontario, we would call it today, in a series of treaty-making stages, territorial treaty-making stages. When Britain negotiated with the Mississauga or Anishinaabe people who had controlled those territories to make lands available, first for loyalists streaming into the territory after the American victory in the Revolution, that is post-1783. And on that occasion, <clears throat> the lands that they access are the lands, as they said then, along the front, meaning along the waterways, 
for the sufficient and important reason that the waterways were the highways. There were no roads, basically. The second stage of the Upper Canadian Treaty Making era follows the War of 1812. And the reason, again, is to provide lands for incoming immigrations, <clears throat> not immigration, pardon me. Upper Canada's non-native population will increase tenfold between the War of 1812 and the 1850s, swamping the First Nations population as well. And that, in that era, treaties are made along a, a, another range further inland, basically. Second stage of the Upper Canadian Treaty era has an important innovation. The, in the first stage, in the 1780s, 1790s, down 1805, the compensation given to First Nations for access to their lands was one-time payments, usually paid in goods. After the War of 1812, there's a shift to compensation in smaller annual payments, annuities in other words. So this is the introduction of annuities, an important component of treaty making in Canada from that time onward. <clears throat> Pardon me. In the third and final stage of the Upper Canadian Treaty Making Era, comes in 1850 and 1862 in what is known sometimes by some people as Ontario's Near North, the Robinson-Huron and Robinson-Superior Treaties in 1850, and the Manitoulin Island Treaty of 1862. These two are important and significant and formative treaties. For one thing, the Robinson Treaties introduce additional elements. First of all, they're made for very large territory, to cover very large territories rather than the smaller tracts that you found in the earlier Upper Canadian Treaties. In the Robinson Treaties, there is provision for reserves. This is new as part of treaty. There were reserves in Upper Canada before 1850, but they were not created as a result of treaty. They were created by other mechanisms and for other purposes. From this point on, treaties will cover larger areas, usually, not always and they will include these, that kind of arrangement, <laughs> basically, about reserves. And the third innovation that comes with Robinson Treaties in 1862 is recognition, a guarantee, an explicit recognition of the continuing hunting, fishing, and gathering rights of the First Nations who enter in the treaty at that time. These are, this is the culmination of the Upper Canadian Treaty Making pre-Confederation period. And compared to what we, we know happened later on and is ongoing now in British Columbia, it seems like kind of minor stuff, almost petty. But if what there was in Upper Canada in terms of territorial treaties was almost all there was until the 1850s in the Pacific Colony. The only other territorial treaty you would have found in British North America in this era is the Rupert's Land Treaty, the Selkirk Treaty of 1817. Other treaties existed in the Maritimes, Peace and Friendship Treaties, but territorial treaties, essentially only Upper Canada. This is the tradition that is building up prior to British Columbia becoming part of Canada in 1871. And British Columbia comes into Confederation with its own tradition of native newcomer relations because it includes from the early period, from the late 18th century, of course, the fur trade connection. And I would argue there are commercial compacts there that are an early form of treaty. The fur trade in British Columbia, of course, will have both a maritime phase at first and then developing as well in the 19th, early 19th century, the land-based phase. And similarly, the relationships will go on there. Now, the importance about, of the fur trade era in British Columbia, as elsewhere, is that it is compatible. Fur trade is compatible with indigenous people maintaining their traditional ways of maintaining themselves. They're not antithetical. They're not really competitive. They're not mutually destructive or dangerous. And there can be a cooperative arrangement. So to that extent, British Columbia in the early years shares the Eastern experience. Where it departs from what happened in the East is that there isn't a peace and friendship treaty phase in British Columbia because there was not the same kind of imperial rivalry here. 
the rivalry between Britain and Spain, for example, had been resolved by the 1790s. The French were not an issue in this part of the country. So the first part is both similar to and different from the, the tradition developed earlier on in the eastern part of the country. British Columbia also introduces something novel, but something that will soon be found in eastern Canada as well. And that is when the fur trade phase is supplanted by new economic relations, specifically by the advent of the mining frontier, especially from the 1850s onward. You get a very different dynamic going on in terms of native newcomer relations. Whereas the fur trade was compatible and cooperative, the mining frontier introduced basically an incompatibility, a competitive relationship, an era of bad relations and of conflict, essentially. And not only that, it increased the numbers of non-native people coming into the territory, and they very often disrupted the economies and the territories of the First Nations. The other thing that happens in, in British Columbia, of course, a hard on the heels of the mining frontier's arrival is the beginning of significant settlement in places like Fort Victoria. Settlement for purposes of agricultural development is also, like mining, incompatible with First Nations traditional use of territories, usually because it disrupts what they're doing. So this too will spell a danger. And as Victoria continues to grow, there is friction, real or, or expected, going on between settlers and First Nations. That problem and the knowledge that settlement will only grow in pace and volume induces the Hudson's Bay Company governor, James Douglas, to initiate the first phase of British Columbia treaty making, that is treaty making unique to British Columbia. I'm referring, of course, to the 14 Douglas treaties of the period from 1850 to 1854. Treaties designed to pave the way for non-native settlement in a peaceful way as the Salish and other peoples made way to allow others to come into their territories. And, this, and of course, Douglas is the person that carries out all those, those treaties. After Douglas's era, both as Hudson Bay Company governor and later as governor of the colony, of course, there is another shift in policy. When British Columbia gets its own legislature, British Columbians, through the representatives, give up the desire to make treaties. Or at least they give up the desire to pay for making treaties, and the British government is unwilling to pay for the treaties that could be made in British Columbia. In other words, after the short period of the Douglas treaties, there's a cessation of treaty making in British Columbia. And settler society in British Columbia moves to an increasingly hostile attitude towards First Nations. First Nations, for their part, are being very severely and adversely affected by a variety of blows, including losses to disease on a huge scale. And the result is that First Nations in many parts of British Columbia, particularly the southern regions, find themselves increasingly pushed to the margins by settlement society as it expands, and settlers show such little interest. Like hot pickers, they find themselves very often forced to make, to patch together a livelihood as best they can around the increasingly dominant Euro-Canadian settlement and economy. And your colleague, John Lutz, has written some very good and helpful material in understanding how that process took place throughout the latter part of the 19th century. Settler society in British Columbia, which is well entrenched by the time BC enters Confederation in 1871, has moved to a position where it essentially denies the existence of Aboriginal title and is uninterested now in making treaties anymore. In the 19th century, they would have said Indian title. And the irony, the strange thing about that is at, a, at that very moment, Sir John A. Macdonald, the first prime minister of the country, is standing up in the House of Commons and talking about the existence of Indian title and explaining why they had to be recognized in the Manitoba Act by creating lands for Métis heads of households. 
So BC is moving to a position where it denies the legitimacy or existence even of Aboriginal title. Canada, while it doesn't talk about it a lot, is at least admitting there, by its actions there is something called Indian title. And not only that, not only do they recognize it indirectly in the Manitoba Act when they deal with the Métis, between 1871 and 1877, the Dominion of Canada, of course, acquires peaceful access to a huge patrimony in the Western interior in the seven numbered treaties of the West. <clears throat> After 1877, in terms of territorial treaty making, there is another bit of a hiatus for about 22 years. And another spate of treaty making occurs for territory beginning again in 1899 with Treaty 8. BC, in a sort of fit of absence of mind, re-enters the national treaty-making story at this point. I say in a fit of absence of mind because BC wasn't interested in participating in treaty-making, and it made that very clear to the federal government. And when the Dominion re realized it had to make treaty in the north, particularly with the Yukon goldfields developing, and it would include part of British Columbia territory, it followed the expedient of simply informing BC of what it was doing. BC ignored the message, paid no mind. Canada went on about its business. So BC found itself brought in a fit of absence of mind again back into the national treaty making story. This second phase of number of treaties from 1899 to 1921, there were four more, eight, nine, 10, and 11 really were operated on the same dynamic as the first, se first seven in the 1870s. By that I mean treaties are made if and when and as non-Aboriginal people want access to First Nations territory. Only if there is an interest in it will treaty be made. There's many, many records of First Nations groups in these territories, Treaty 8, 9, 10, 11, Petitioning for treaty from the 1880s onward, and Canada saying, no, it's simply not going to make, make any treaty, it's not interested. What changes? Well, things like discovering gold and Yukon and having to secure the access route overland route, for example. Or perhaps the clearest, the most striking and graphic example of all is what happens in 1921. First Nations in the southern part of the Northwest Territories have been petitioning literally for decades to enter treaty and been ignored. And then in 1920, oil is discovered at Norman Wells. 1921, Treaty 11 is concluded, basically. It's the clearest, most graphic example of how Canada responds only if, when, and as southern economic interests show an interest in Aboriginal lands. And what their interest is about, of course, is access to the resources. This is a Treaty 9 party going across a lake in Northern Ontario. After the conclusion of the second set of number, treaties, the Northern Number Treaties, Canada sort of becomes a British Columbian. It, show, it adopts an attitude of hostility towards the very notion of Aboriginal title. The federal government is not interested in treaties. It makes two more minor ones in Ontario, known as the Williams Treaties in 1923. And they were really just a matter of cleaning up some of the mistakes that had been made way back in the late 19th century in those early Upper Canadian treaties. <clears throat> but otherwise, Canada is as British Columbia is. It denies the existence of Aboriginal title. It fights First Nations groups who try to establish the notion of Aboriginal title. For example, through the Mackenzie McBride Commissioner through appearances before Parliamentary Committee in 1926. This man is perhaps the best example of the new mentality at work in Ottawa. This is Duncan Campbell Scott, long-serving Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs down to the early 1930s. He was famous or infamous for many things, but he was probably most notorious for something he said to a parliamentary committee in 1920 when he was advocating something called compulsory enfranchisement. What compulsory enfranchisement was, was taking away people's Indian status whether they were willing for, to have that happen or not. And on that occasion, Duncan Campbell Scott, the deputy minister, said, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our policies have always aimed 
a distinguishing status. That's what education and enfranchisement are all about, and we should continue that until there are no more Indians, speaking legally, of course, not a legal category, not physically, until there are no more Indians and no Indian question. That's the mindset now in Ottawa. This is the lowest point in the relationship between government and First Nations in Canadian history. And with that mindset at work in Ottawa, you will not be surprised that Canada does not make any more treaties for territory for 50 years. And when they do begin to make, Canada does begin to make treaty again in the 1970s, it's because they're forced to, not because they want to. This is one of the generating stations in the James Bay Hydro Project in Quebec. In 1970, liberal, provincial liberal leader Robert Bourassa is elected, forms government with the slogan, going, going to create 100,000 jobs. And when reporters say, how are you going to create 100,000 jobs? He said, we're going to create 100,000 jobs with the project of the century. What was the project of the century, they asked? The James Bay Power Project. We are going to harness the hydraulic resources of part of the James Bay watershed, a huge area, enormous hydroelectric potential there. Well, you know, to that point, that was pretty much business as usual. That's what provinces had been doing across the country for decades. Ontario did it, Manitoba did it, Saskatchewan did it, everybody did it. But something had changed by the 1970s. And what had changed was the James Bay Cree said, in effect, oh, no, you're not. And the James Bay Cree, led by a very young, dynamic, effective leader by the name of Billy Diamond, went down to Montreal and hired themselves a really good, irascible Irish-Canadian lawyer named James O'Reilly, <laughs> who put together a tremendous case, historically-based case, arguing for an injunction, arguing that these were unsurrendered Aboriginal lands and that the court should force the, co the Crown Corporation to spend all work on the James Bay project. To the surprise of almost everyone, the first decision was favorable to the James Bay Cree. Judge Malouf issued an interim injunction that ordered all construction and other activity on the James Bay project or anything associated with it to stop immediately. Now, the James Bay Corporation and the province got that overturned with really indecent haste very quickly. But a point had been made. The courts were, you know, willing to listen to an argument, and First Nations were willing to stand up. They're saying, no, you're not anymore. We're not going to let that happen anymore. And as if that wasn't enough, that first confrontation over James Bay took place in 1972. In the following year, in the western end of the country, of course, something very, very relate, closely related but different occurred as well. The gentleman on the left is Frank Calder. What happened in 1973 was that the Supreme Court of Canada handed down its decision, pardon me, its decisions, because it was very much a split decision, in the Calder case. This was brought by the Nishka, and they're arguing that they've got unsurrendered title to the Nass River Valley. Now, they didn't win. But six of the seven judges in their rulings conceded that there was something that existed in law called Aboriginal title. And that was a huge advance, legally speaking, in terms of what Aboriginal people had by way of legal weapons to defend them, themselves and their territories. So you've got the James Bay confrontation in 1972 and the Calder decision the following year. A reporter asked Pierre Trudeau what he thought of the, uh, the Calder decision, the Supreme Court. And Trudeau replied, I guess you have more rights than we thought you did when we did the white paper in 1969. Yes, indeed, that's what it meant. That's exactly what it meant. Well, to bring this to a point for their story tonight, the federal government responded, and Trudeau responded to the Calder decision by creating the Office of Native Claims and what's known as the Comprehensive Claims Resolution Process. It set up a system to address and to resolve claims based on Aboriginal title. Comprehensive claims for territory are claims by First Nations that the land belongs to them because they were never defeated militarily by Canada 
and they never gave up their rights via treaty. So therefore, by negotiation, the theory is, <coughs> through comprehensive claim settlements, you will have <coughs> new treaties being made. The James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement of 1975 is usually thought of as the first modern territorial treaty. <coughs> the comprehensive claim settlements that begin to come out later on, the 1980s and 1990s, are another, another example of that. We are now into a new phase of territorial treaty making. It consists both of separately negotiated treaties, like James Bay, it's technically a comprehensive claim, but it's effectively negotiated separately, <coughs> and comprehensive claim settlements, both of which are now protected under our Constitution by Section 35. Federal government acknowledges the Constitution says that comprehensive claim settlements are treaties and protected by the Constitution. So finally, the final addition to this last phase of treaty making, territorial treaty making, is of course the one that brings the story back to BC completely again. Not just the Nishka Treaty, which is negotiated of course in the 1990s, but the British Columbia Treaty Commission process that's going on, has been going on since 1992. We've had none of it. We've had Nishka, you know, with the BCTC process. There's unfinished business going on. There are two imp settlements implemented, three more awaiting ratification, and another 55 or so in various stages of discussions or getting ready for discussions. Treaty making is alive and well and ongoing. Treaty making has a presence, present. It has a past. It began with commercial compacts, it evolved with peace and friendship treaties. In the 18th century, territorial treaties emerged and were implemented and adopted at various stages in various parts of the country, including British Columbia. The treaty making, territorial treaty making phase ended in 1923 for a while, for half a century, and then resumed in the 1970s, both with negotiated treaties and comprehensive claim settlements and now, too, with the BCTC Commission process. Canada has a long, complicated, diverse, and I think very rich and interesting treaty-making history. And British Columbia is very much part of that. From commercial compacts, to the Douglas Treaties, to Treaty 8, to Nishka, to the BCTC process. Canadians are all treaty people, and that includes British Columbians. And the challenge of the 21st century, and what we need to frame for the 21st century, of course, is trying to make that treaty relationship right, and trying to make it work. This cartoon, which is about an elder testifying before Judge McEachern in the Delgamute case, basically, introducing their stories and songs, and you see contrast between the Euro-Canadian law and the First Nations culture and history, for example, going on there. Well, that's, that's really what the challenge is about, is to try to get those two things, not one overtaking the other, but in being able to work together in some complementary, compatible, positive way. All Canadians are treaty people. This is a challenge all Canadians have in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you.